Well, good morning. So glad that you made it here this morning. You're with us. And for those of you who joined us online, good morning. We're so glad that you are here. If you have a Bible with you, grab it and let's go to Acts chapter 12, the book of Acts. So New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, Acts chapter 12. It'll take us a little while to get there, but trust me, we'll get there in a little bit. As Isaac mentioned, we are in the second week of a sermon series that we're calling Rethink. And we're just acknowledging the reality that in this cultural moment that we're living through, there are a lot of people who are rethinking their faith. They're rethinking God. They're rethinking their relationship to the church. A lot of people are, are taking apart the, the faith that, that was given to them, and they're looking at the elements of it saying, is this true? Is this good? Is this mine? And some of you may be in that place in your life right now. We want you to know we're glad that you are here. We think this is a good place for you to be asking those big questions. Others of us aren't in that place right now, but uh, there's a good chance that there are people in our life who are, people in our life who are rethinking faith, people that we love, people that are friends, family, some of us children or grandchildren. And so if there's so many people in the world right now, in our culture right now, who are rethinking their faith. The church needs to talk about it. And so that's what this series is all about, is just looking at this reality and, and looking to the scriptures to, to provide for us some perspective on this process of rethinking faith, wrestling with big questions and doubts. And as we begin this morning, I, I want to tell you about a story about a time I sat with one of my students when I was a seminary professor. And I tried to talk her out of believing in God. Now, some of you hopefully aren't sitting there going, I knew it all along, the pastor doesn't actually believe in God. No, don't worry, right? Before you get nervous or leave without hearing the rest, I believe deeply in the God of the Bible revealed preeminently in Jesus. And I want you to as well. But what happened that day, as I sat with that young woman, she, um, she was struggling deeply with doubt. And she had heard me talk about the fact that I have had times in my life where I've struggled with doubt. And so she thought, maybe I could help. And as we sat together that morning in that coffee shop, she just began to share her struggles, the, the issues that she was wrestling with with regard to God. And as I listened to her Describe for me, God as she understood him, I realized that, that part of the problem was that she had come to embrace a distortion of who God really is. A distortion of the God of the Bible preeminently revealed in Jesus. And so as gently and lovingly as I could, I tried to persuade her to stop believing in that God because some gods are worth disbelieving. And there may be some of you this morning who would say, I I'm in one of those seasons where I'm wrestling with questions or, or I'm struggling with my faith, I'm rethinking my faith. And it may be that some of the struggle that you're facing is because you've been given a distorted view of the God of the Bible preeminently revealed in Jesus. Maybe you have embraced and therefore are struggling with a distorted view of God. And so this morning, as gently and lovingly as I know how, I want to invite you to stop believing in that God. But there may be others who are here that you'd say, I'm not struggling to believe. It may be that you've actually wholeheartedly embraced a, a view of God that is nonetheless a distortion of the God we find in the pages of the Bible preeminently revealed in Jesus. That you've embraced distortions of God that, that are unworthy of him. And that are not good for your souls and, and for your lives. And so this morning, I want us to look together. I want us to think together about what I have found through my years of ministry to be what I think are the three most prominent distorted views of God. And to try to gently persuade you to stop believing in those gods. And the first one, the, the first distortion of God that I think many of us tend to wrestle with is what I would call the quid pro quo God. The quid pro quo God. The, the quid pro quo is just an old Latin phrase that means this for that. It, it became particularly prominent in our political discourse a few years back, but I want to make sure you know this has nothing to do with that, right? The, 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 this little phrase just means if I do what you want me to do, then you're obligated to do what I want you to do. 
And I think sometimes we can wind up with that view of God. If I do what God wants me to do, he is obligated to do in return what I want him to do. That we sometimes find ourselves tortured by feelings like God didn't hold up his end of the bargain. If I live right and do my quiet time, God will give me deep fulfillment in the job of my dreams. If I'm a good person and I go to church all the time, God will give me that spouse I long for. If I sacrifice for my family, loving them and serving them, then my kids won't go off the rails. If I follow Jesus, if I try really hard to follow Jesus, I won't experience crippling anxiety. And we think if I do my part, then God is obligated to do his part. And then when God doesn't come through, when, when things don't look the way we thought they were supposed to look, when, when things don't feel the way we thought they were supposed to feel, then I struggle to believe in God. But friends, the God of the Bible preeminently revealed in Jesus is not the quid pro quo God. You see, the Quid pro quo God reduces life with God to a kind of cosmic give and take and actually winds up becoming another form of the prosperity gospel. But this one not having to do with the size of our bank accounts, but the circumstances of our lives. The God of the Bible revealed preeminently in Jesus isn't the quid pro quo God. The quid pro quo God is the God of the law of karma. But that's not what we find described in the scriptures about the nature of God. You see, billions of people in the world today have religious worldviews informed by the law of karma. You get what's coming to you. And tragically, many Christians wind up embracing that kind of view of God. And to be sure, the Bible teaches that what a person sows, they will reap. There are consequences for our actions. And yet, we fundamentally misunderstand the God of the Bible preeminently revealed in Jesus if we understand him to abide by the law of karma. Because this, friends, would not be good news. For us. You see, the Christian doctrine of sin simply says that, that, that we fall short of God's highest standards for our lives, that, that we turn away from God's deep desires and expectations for us. And if that's the case, I, for one, have no problem believing in the Christian concept of sin because I fall short of my own highest expectations for myself all the time. I, I turn away from my deepest desires for who I really want to be all the time. And if The quid pro quo God was true. This would be profoundly bad news for us. And yet, we see something very different about the God of the Bible, preeminently revealed in Jesus. Think about what the psalmist says in Psalm 103, verse eight. The Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in love. He will not always accuse, nor will he harbor his anger forever. He does not treat us as our sins, he does not treat us as our sins deserve or repay us according to our iniquities. He is not the God of karma. You see, in this passage, we see the way that the God of the Bible reveals himself over and over and over again. When the God of the Bible reaches for words to describe himself, those words are compassionate, gracious, slow to anger, abounding in love. And it says he he will not be angry forever. The reality is sin makes God mad. He gets angry at sin, but he gets angry at sin because he loves you and me. God hates sin because he loves us and desires something so much more for us. And yet he does not treat us as we deserve or repay us for our iniquities. The God of the Bible isn't the God of karma, but the God of grace. And this is what Paul captures in Romans 5, verse 6 through 8. Where Paul writes, you see, at just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Christ died for those who failed to live up to their own highest expectation, much less God's. Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though for a good person, someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. 
the, the, the God revealed in the scriptures and preeminently in Jesus is not the God of karma, but the God of grace. Grace, a, a, a favor that is unmerited, that is unearned, a love that can never be deserved, but is given freely, that is lavished on us in Christ, the Bible says. The God of the Bible, preeminently revealed in Jesus, is not the God of karma, but the God of grace. The quid pro quo God does not exist and is worth disbelieving. Second is what I would call the security guard God. The security guard God. A, a, a number of years ago, before Kim and I were married, she worked as an overnight security guard in Fair Park, downtown Dallas. Right? She, she, was, uh, she was armed with a purple shirt and a walkie-talkie. And given a list of, of, of codes to call out in the walkie-talkie if she encountered something. Apparently, a 1054 was finding a dead body. Thankfully, she never had to call in a 1054. But she's walking around the perimeter of the building at 2 o'clock in the morning as a security guard with a purple shirt and a walkie-talkie. Now, this was just a little bit before Kim and I were married. I have a picture here to show you of the day that we were married. Um, so if you ever wanted to know what Pastor Barry would look like if he shaved his beard, pretty much just exactly like that. But look at that smile. Is that smile gonna intimidate anybody at two o'clock in the morning in the purple shirt and a walkie-talkie? No. Oh. The security guard, the whole point of being a security guard is, is to watch to make sure nothing bad happens. And I think that that's the way we sometimes distort God. And so God's job is just to watch over things and make sure nothing bad ever happens, to watch over my life and to make sure nothing ever bad happens. And, and so when we have that kind of distorted view of God, no wonder we struggle with this idea, why would God allow bad things to happen to good people? We struggle with it in the abstract. Why, God, would you allow bad things happen to good people? We struggle with it in the concrete. God, why would you allow this to happen to me? But the God who doesn't let bad things happen to good people is not the God of the Bible, preeminently revealed in Jesus. In fact, the heart of the Christian story is that the worst thing imaginable happened to the, worst per the best person imaginable. Right? The worst thing imaginable happened to the best person imaginable. The cross, crucifixion, the worst punishment that human beings have ever devised, the worst form of execution known to humankind happened to the best person, the incarnate Son of God. At the heart of the Christian story is that the worst that could possibly happen be imagined happen to the best person imaginable. Look with me at this story that's told in Acts chapter 12. Acts chapter 12, the context here is this is not that long after Jesus is crucified, resurrected, the, the church is born, and, and um, Peter is captured. Peter the apostle, one of Jesus' earliest followers, is captured and is thrown into prison. And in verse 5, we pick up and it says, So Peter was kept in prison. But the church was earnestly praying to God for him. Right? The church gathered and they were earnestly praying for Peter's deliverance. They were praying for a miracle. God, get him out of prison. And, and what you read, if you read the following few verses, is that they got what they asked for. Peter got a miracle. He was delivered. And then we pick up in verse 11. Then Peter came to himself and said, now I know without a doubt that the Lord sent his angel and rescued me from Herod's clutches and from everything the Jewish people were hoping would happen. And when this had dawned on him, he went to the house of Mary, the mother of John, also called Mark, where many people had gathered and were praying. And Peter knocked on the outer entrance and a servant named Rhoda came to answer the door. And when she recognized Peter's voice, she was so overjoyed that she ran back without opening the door and exclaimed, Peter's at the door left him standing outside. I love that. Now look at this. You're out of your mind, they told her. When she kept on insisting that it was so, they said, it must be his angel. But Peter kept knocking. And when they opened the door, they saw him and they were astonished. And Peter motioned with his hand for them to be quiet. And he described how the Lord had brought him out of prison. 
Such a fun story. Peter is out there knocking, and when the word gets to the rest of them, they're there praying for a miracle. They're there praying for deliverance, and when the word comes to them that their prayer has been answered, they think, you're crazy. You've lost your mind. But then Peter comes in, and he stands there among them, miraculously delivered. But to me, the poignancy of this story has always always been found by looking back at the very beginning of the chapter. Look with me in verse one. It was about this time that King Herod arrested some who belonged to the church, intending to persecute them. And he had James, the brother of John, put to death with the sword. James, the brother of John, James, one of Jesus' inner circle, one of the three, one of Jesus' closest friends, is put to the sword after he is arrested by Herod. And I have to imagine that the same believers who gathered to pray for Peter's miraculous release were gathered together to pray the same thing for James. And so we find this and we wrestle with the question, why did Peter get a miracle and James didn't? And the most honest answer that we can give is, We don't know. Some of you perhaps have heard me tell the story of uh, the day that I was sitting writing a sermon and uh, I got the email that Pastor Andy, our beloved pastor here of 32 years at IBC, the, the email letting us know that he had been diagnosed with stage four colon cancer. And uh, this was devastating to me because this is my my hero, my mentor, my pastor, my friend. And it was devastating to me because it was just a few weeks after my sister Amy died, after a short battle with cancer. And some of you who are here, a part of our church during that season, remember that hundreds of us were crying out to God and praying for Andy to be delivered, praying for Andy to get a miracle. And two major surgeries and 18 months of chemotherapy as he continued to grit it out and stand up here and preach the word to us. After two years of this journey, Andy was declared cancer-free. Andy got his miracle. And I'm so thankful for what God did in Andy's life. I'm so thankful that he's still such a vital part of my life today. But I gotta tell you, through the years, I have wrestled with the question, why did Andy get a miracle and Amy didn't? There were hundreds of people praying earnestly for her deliverance, for her to get a miracle. Why did Andy get a miracle and Amy didn't? Why did Peter get a miracle and James didn't? The the only honest answer we have to give is we don't know. But here's what I do know. At the center of the Christian story, is that the worst thing imaginable happened to the best person imaginable. And that doesn't make my questions go away. It doesn't finally resolve all of those questions, but it helps me to trust in the God of the Bible preeminently revealed in Jesus no matter what comes my way. You see, friends, the Bible never belittles human suffering, but it never ignores it either. The Bible takes very seriously the reality of our suffering. The heart of the story is that the God of the Bible preeminently revealed in Jesus has entered into our suffering, has taken it upon himself on the cross, has triumphed over it through his resurrection in order to secure for us a hope beyond it. The security guard God does not exist and is worthy of disbelieving. Finally, The guilt trip God. The guilt trip God. We've all experienced a guilt trip, right? It's when you try to manipulate the behavior of someone by causing them to feel guilty. And, And it's as though they say, if I can just get you to feel enough shame, then maybe you will change, maybe you will behave, maybe you will act the way I want you to. And some of us see God that way. As though if we just feel guilty enough, as though if we just feel enough shame, then maybe we'll behave. The guilt trip God is all about behavior modification, sin management. The guilt trip God is the God of shame. And this was the God that my student that day was struggling to believe. The God that I invited her to stop 
believing in. The guilt trip God is always disappointed in you, leaving you constantly disappointed in yourself. The guilt trip God is the God of shame. And now hear me, feeling shame is not inherently bad, it is inherently human. And feeling shame is not inherently bad because it can keep us from doing shameful things. But I don't think God ever uses shame. I don't think God ever uses shame to change us. He loves us to change us. I don't think God ever uses shame to make us Christ-like. He loves us into Christ-likeness. God never uses shame. He comes to embrace us in our shame, to relieve us of our shame, to undo our shame, and to free us from shame. I believe we see something really powerful about the character of God revealed in the Bible all the way back at the beginning of the story. All the way back in the beginning of the story in Genesis chapter three, where we see these words in verse nine. But the Lord God called to the man and said, where are you? If you're familiar at all with the story, this is the story of the archetypal human story of the fall into sin. And after the man and the woman have rebelled against God, gone their own way, they immediately feel shame and they hide. Hide first from each other and then from God. And notice the way God approaches them. Adam, where are you? I've talked before about uh, my son Pearson when he was little and I'll try to get through this illustration without breaking down because he's the one we just sent to New York City a few weeks back. But when he was little, he's the, the real feeler of the family. When he was little, if he would get in trouble, if he'd done something wrong, he would feel shame and he would run and hide. And the problem is he, he didn't really have that many good options for hiding places. He could hide behind a dresser in his closet. He could hide underneath his bed or he would go into the bathroom and pull the shower curtain. And when I was at my worst, right, if I was mad at whatever happened and I was not in a good place, I was at my worst, I would come busting in that room and I'd say, Pearson, come out right now. I know where you are. But when I was at my best, when I was, when I was more like my heavenly father, I'd come into the room. And I'd say, Pearson, where are you, buddy? Come on out. And God doesn't come busting into the scene saying, Adam, come out. I know where you are. He says, Adam, where are you? What is this you've done? It's an invitation to relationship. God never uses shame, but he comes to embrace us in our shame, to relieve us of our shame, to undo our, undo our shame, to free us from shame, and to lead us into life change. Eugene Peterson captures this in his rendering in the message of Romans 2.4 that says, God is kind, but he is not soft. In his kindness, he takes us firmly by the hand and leads us into radical life change. The rendering in the IV is, it's the kindness of the Lord that leads us to repentance. And it's interesting, the Greek word for repentance there, it's the word metanoia. It means a change of mind. God leads us through his kindness to radically rethink our understanding of who he is. He is the God who lavishes his grace upon us, who loves us in our shame and leads us into life change. Not through shame, but through love. Friends, the guilt trip God does not exist and is worth disbelieving. You see, I think that we oftentimes find ourselves struggling to believe in God, but we wind up struggling to believe in distortions of the God who is revealed to us preeminently in Jesus Christ across the pages of the Bible. We wind up with distortions of God, believing in the quid pro quo God, the God of karma. You get what's coming to, uh, to you. Or we wind up believing in the security guard God who doesn't let bad things happen to good people. Or we wind up believing in the guilt trip God who shames us into life change. But friends, none of these, 
None of these are the God of the Bible revealed preeminently in Jesus. All of these are distortions. And so, I lovingly but gently invite you to stop believing in those gods because some gods are worthy of disbelieving. And I invite you this morning to place your deep confidence in the God of the Bible preeminently revealed in Jesus. Let's pray. Father, I pray for all of us who are here in these moments of response, that we would be open to the response to you that is fitting for each of our lives today, that your spirit would move in this place, in this time, causing us to bring ourselves fully before you, Lord, and if there's any here who today needs to be the day that they embrace by faith who you are and what you've done by sending your son, the Lord Jesus, to come to earth as a baby, to live a perfect life, to die on the cross and to be raised again on the third day, that that through trusting in him, we might have the hope of forgiveness and the promise of eternal life. God, if today needs to be the day for somebody in this room to embrace that story as their own, to embrace that truth by faith, God, would, would you move them to respond? And God, for, for some of us who we've embraced Christ by faith a long time ago and yet we've allowed distortions of your character to come into our thinking, God, help us. Help us to let go to stop believing in distortions of you and to trust deeply in your character. And so move in our midst in these moments of response by your spirit, we pray. And we pray it in Jesus' name, amen.